The world in which we live is full of misery. Our society just seems to be tearing apart at the seams. Throughout our society, people you meet in your walk of day life, things you see on television, things you see on social media, if that's your inclination, treat Christianity with the utmost of disrespect or maybe even worse, simply ignore it. Every type of immorality seems to be gaining traction as normal and accepted behavior. Violence is everywhere. Folks that used to disagree in somewhat of an agreeable fashion over politics and the like now scream at each other, seem to hate each other. Maybe they do. In the last year and a half or so, we've experienced a pandemic. I know that has hit this church family particularly hard, something we didn't even know existed two years ago. Now strikes fear in people's heart. Our world is full of misery. Bet y'all are glad you asked me to preach, huh? <laughs> We need joy in our lives now, like never before. The book of Philippians, which is the the book from which our text will be taken this morning, has often been called the book of joy or the epistle of joy. The word joy or rejoice is found in this very short epistle at least 16 times that I count. Philippians, the fourth chapter, the fourth verse says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And just in case you miss that, Paul speaking, not me, I will say it again. Rejoice. Let's think about the human writer of this book for a moment. Let's think for a minute about Paul the Apostle who under inspiration of the Spirit penned the words that we find in this epistle. His life was really cushy and really good, wasn't it? Well, I don't know. Let's think about that for a minute. When this book was written, he was on house arrest in Rome. And his journey there wasn't all that easy. He had been arrested, he had been beaten, he had been shipwrecked by a poisonous snake. And when he finally makes it to Rome, he's chained with a six-foot chain 24-7, to a big Roman guard who watches his every moment and Paul is in these circumstances not knowing what tomorrow might bring including his own execution. There's no doubt that we suffer problems in our society. We suffer difficulties. There's misery in our society. But I wouldn't trade place with Paul and yet Paul, in the circumstances in which he found himself, is able to write these words in Philippians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you, to the interest of others. 
Here's a problem. By our sinful nature, we are naturally selfish. There's nothing more selfish than a baby. You say, all right, let me get a straight feeling. You come over here to preach, and first thing you tell us about how miserable the world is, and now you tell us you don't like babies. No, I did not say I don't like babies. I just, being truthful, babies are selfish creatures. I like babies. Mostly I don't have to take care of them, but I, I, I mean, babies are cute, but babies are selfish. If they're hungry... They don't really much care what you might be doing. They don't much care what time of day it is or time of night. They're going to let you know. If a baby needs their diaper changed, they're going to let you know. If a baby wants something it doesn't even really know what they want, baby's going to let you know and expect you to figure it out. Babies are naturally selfish Creatures. And that's okay. Because they grow out of it fairly quickly. And we all came from that exact same circumstance. But here's the problem. Some people never really grow out of it. And, you know, we kind of put up with that out of a six-month-old or a 12-month-old or everywhere you, you, you know, draw the mark for babies. But when six-year-olds are still selfish, that's just not cute anymore. And when 26-year-olds or 46-year-olds or 66-year-olds or 86-year-olds are still selfish, that is not cute anymore. And it's no fun. Let me tell you this. Selfishness does not bring joy. We might think it does. There might be a temptation to think that for a little bit, but it's simply not true. And I will give you the best example that you're going to be able to think of. King Solomon. King Solomon had it all. He had power, he had prestige, he had possessions. There was none greater than Solomon during his time on earth. But Solomon, in large measure, and he did some good things, but in large measure, Solomon lived for himself. Solomon lived for his own joy. Solomon lived for his own pleasure. If you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter, God, knowing that Israel would one day demand a human ruler, a king like the other nations, gives some parameters for those kings and says they're not to multiply horses, they're not to multiply wives, they're not to multiply wealth. Well, how did Solomon do on those scores? We learned that he had 40,000 stables for his horses. He had 700 wives, and just in case that wasn't enough, he had 300 concubines. And he had wealth more than any king of the earth. Solomon had everything his earthly heart could desire. And yet Solomon did not have joy. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, verse 2, and I'm quoting from the King James just because I think so many of us will recognize the words, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Solomon, near the end of his life, realized that a selfish lifestyle does not bring joy. It's meaningless. That's what these, that's really what it's talking about here with vanity. It's just, it's meaningless. It's of no regard. All this power and prestige and wealth that Solomon had amassed really counted for nothing. So we do not find joy in selfishness. We don't find joy in possessions. We don't find joy in prestige. We don't find joy in, in, in power. 
where do we find joy? We start finding joy in unity. We start making joy complete by uniting in the same love, the same spirit, and the same mind. If you look at those words, we unite in our emotional life, we unite in our Christian life, we unite in our mental lives. Every aspect of our being becomes one with one another but most importantly, I mean, the, the truth be told, we could unite in, in each of these areas in exactly the wrong way. We unite in love, spirit, and mind through Jesus Christ, our Savior. All of us are different in so many ways. As I stand up here, I can see around the room. We have older people, we have younger people, uh, we have taller people, we have shorter people, we have thinner people, we have heavier... We're different in a lot of different ways. But here is how each of us who claim Christ is our Savior are exactly alike. We are children of God. We are adopted heirs to the promise through Jesus, our Savior. And when we realize that that Unity is greater than anything that divides us. And we begin to unite. We will start to make our joy complete. We are stronger and we are happier when we're united. I remember 30, 35 years ago, my mother, for reasons best known to her, decided that she wanted to move her piano. I didn't say that exactly right. She decided she wanted her piano moved. And so she calls, and uh, no problem. I round up some, some of my friends. We drive over to help her move her piano. It's no big deal. When we got there, we found out she didn't just want to move her piano. She wanted to move her piano upstairs. And we started by trying to, to talk her out of it. Anybody who knew my mother, knows, uh, well, that wasn't going very far, very fast. So there's nothing for it, but we got to move this piano. When I say up the stairs, I mean up, up a staircase. They didn't have an elevator. So there's four of us, and each of us kind of gets on one corner. And it's like one, two, three, and the piano didn't go anywhere. Because each one of us, including me, thought, well, maybe the others will do it. <laughs> you, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I can kind of get away with this. Maybe I can bluff my way through it. And it, my father looks at Mark. Mark looks at Ronnie. Ronnie looks at me. We all look at each other. So, all right, <laughs> we got to do it. So this time on one, two, three, everybody lifts. Now, I'm not going to tell you it was easy because it wasn't easy. But we got it done, and we got the piano upstairs by uniting in our effort. We were stronger with the four working together, and we were a lot happier with the four working together. My father had to stay there. The three of us got out of there as quick as we could because we didn't know what else you might have said you wanted to move. But we are stronger, and we are happier when we are united. We need to lean into our Christian brothers and sisters. God built us for fellowship. God didn't create a bunch of lone rangers. God created the church so that we could worship Him, bring glory to Him, be evangelical for His cause. But God also created the church for fellowship. We are stronger together. It's like any given string, little threads, easy to break, but you braid them all together and you've got a strong rope. When we have difficulties, when we have problems, when we have trials in our life, we need to lean into one another. And the reciprocal is also true. 
when our brothers and sisters have problems and have trials in their life, we need to be there for them so that they can lean into us. Galatians, the sixth chapter, second verse, first part of the second verse says, carry each other's burdens. It's really antithetical. The world tells us that we will find happiness, that we will find joy living for ourselves. The world tells us that joy comes from what we can get, from what we can be, from what we can have. But like Solomon, we quickly find out that's not the source of true joy. We start making our joy complete by uniting together. We talked about our earthly nature. Our earthly nature, our sinful nature, is to be selfish. Our final point is a contrast. By our spiritual nature, we view others as more significant than ourselves. So simple, so easy to say, and sometimes so hard to do. We view others as more significant than ourselves when we love one another. Jesus finds himself the subject of questioning by a group of Pharisees. And the Pharisees seemingly are interested in knowledge. In reality, they're interested in trying to trip Jesus up. They're interested in trying to catch him somehow or the other. And they ask him questions. That was never a really good idea if you were trying to trip Jesus up. And he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your spirit. And then Jesus goes further and says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22 39. Love is the key. We find joy when we view others as more significant than ourselves. And we view others as more significant than ourselves when we truly love one another. There's an old joke that I kind of love because it applies to me a little bit. It says, you know, everybody makes fun of rednecks uh, until they need their car fixed. (laughs) We all have talents. We all have abilities. We all have spiritual gifts given to us by God. And for some reason or the other, the world kind of assigns values to these things so that one seems to be more important than others. I'll tell you the honest truth. I don't understand what a celebrity is. I really don't. I mean, I understand people who are famous for being uh, good musicians or good athletes or good actors, or de- but people who are just famous for being famous, I don't really get it and I don't understand it. But I'm wrong because you look at People magazine and it tells you I'm wrong. We, we as, 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 as people in the world want to say, well, this person has a talent that's more important than the other, or this person has a talent that is better than the other. So all talents are from God. And all talents are equally important to God. And we each serve God in different ways. And when we realize that the way you serve God is just as important, maybe more important than the way I serve God and vice versa, it becomes easier to view others as more significant than ourselves because we realize uh, they really are. 
Jesus goes on, and this is a verse that, that's easy to kind of skip over, and when I say he goes on, it's a different time and a different place, but Jesus in the Gospels, and I'm in John the 13th chapter, the 34th verse now. This is uh, in, in a, a period of a long uh, presentation, speech that Jesus is making uh, just before his death. And Jesus says, A new command I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Wait a minute. What's new about that command? Jesus says it's a new command. We just read that, 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 that weeks earlier, Jesus had said the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, a new command I give to you, love one another. What am I missing? I'll tell you. you got to read the rest of the verse. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Did Jesus love us as he loved himself? No. Jesus loved us more than he loved himself. Jesus loved us enough to die for us on the cross, not for anything that Jesus did wrong, but for everything that we did wrong. And so Jesus is, is up the stakes here. Under the law, we were required to love your neighbor as yourself. Under grace, we're obligated to love one another more than we love ourselves. That's not selfish. That's exactly the opposite. That is selflessness. And that is how we find joy. As we bring to a close, I want to take you back to your childhood. And Christmas is coming. You're seven, eight years old. And the tree's up and the stockings are hung by the chimney with care. And what are you thinking about? Be honest. What am I going to get? That's exactly what, I, you know, maybe you were better children than me. That's what I was thinking about. You know, am I going to get a bicycle? Am I going to get a pony? Am I going to get whatever it may be that you were wishing for? And that was your total focus. And you were so excited to go downstairs on Christmas morning to see what you received. At some point in your life, Maybe your teenage years, maybe your early adult years, but at some point in your life, without really being conscious of it, without really recognizing that it was happening, you became focused on something you wanted to give. Might have been your parent, might have been your, nah, probably not your brother, might have been a girlfriend, a boyfriend, someone that meant a lot in your life, and you recognized that instead of spending time thinking about what you might be getting, you started thinking about what you could give that would make someone happy. Jesus does not say these words in the recorded Gospels. These words of Jesus are recorded in Acts, the 20th chapter, the second half of verse 35. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Blessed means happy. Happy means joy. And when we put all of this together, if I were going to roll this into a little sound bite, and you, somebody's thinking, well, if you could do that feeling, why don't you do that 25 minutes ago and we could have been out of here? Well, that, that's not the way it works. But if I was going to bring all this to a conclusion, I would say this. The key to having complete joy in our life is to love one another and put others first. There is so much that we can do for others. There's so much we can do for others in our church. There's so much we can do for others in our community as an outreach of our church. Tim, in making the announcements and calling attention to the, the bulletin, 
uh, talked about all the different ministries of the church. Find a place to get involved. If, 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 if you go to our pastors, if you go to, to, to various church leaders and say, I want to get involved, I want to help, where can I plug in? And they tell you, oh, there's just nothing for you to do. I'm going to be pretty surprised by that. Find a place for service and you will find joy. It's interesting to note that Paul is writing these words to Christians. You can't unite in Christ unless you're in Christ. That's fairly simple and fairly straightforward. You can't be a part of the body of Christ unless you are in Christ, unless you have accepted Jesus as your Savior. And I am, I mean, it's not like I don't know y'all. I know most of y'all. And I understand that in some large measure, I'm preaching this morning to people who are already Christians. But if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I can say this and I can say this very quickly. you got to go to step one before you can go to step two. And everything I've pretty much been talking about this morning is, 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 is step two. If you want complete in your life, you have to start with Jesus in your life.